Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Lonergan. I am the chief um, artistic producer here at the Park Avenue Armory uh, and wanted to uh, welcome you for this exciting opportunity to hear more from Julian about his work, uh, Euphoria. Um, so I have just a couple little overview items. Please indulge me uh, just to talk a little bit about uh, the piece and how it came to the armory and a little bit about Julian. Um, the armory takes uh, great pride in our relationship with artists that we have worked with in the past, always giving them the opportunity to come back and see what is next in the drill hall. And that is how um, we came to Euphoria. Um, many of you may remember Julian's work, Manifesto, which had its North American premiere here at the Park Avenue Armory and received great acclaim and continues to receive great acclaim. Uh, Julian has come with us, come to us with Euphoria. Uh, Euphoria is a multi-channel film installation, examines capitalism and the effects of unlimited economic growth on society. Using quotations from economists, business magnets, philosophers, and other notable historic and contemporary figures from Sophocles, Warren Buffett, Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman to Audre Lorde, John Steinbeck, and Snoop Dogg, Julian creates an unexpected juxtaposition of language and context that brings new meaning to the words. Um, this cross-disciplinary work that merges film, spoken word, and music um, features a, an original score composed by Sammy Miosa with an additional composition by Cassie Kenoshi. Uh, we'll be speaking with Sammy in a little bit as well about uh, this collaboration. Julian, <laughs> how many of you heard of these, these uh, artist talks where you're vetted for, you're feted for a few minutes before. Um, Julian is an artist based in Berlin um, and has achieved international acclaim for his visually opulent and meticulously choreographed moving image artworks. Inspired equally by histories of film, art, and popular culture, his work transports viewers into surreal theatrical realms where humor and satire seduce audiences into familiar worlds made strange. Julian's work has been shown at museums and galleries around the world, including the Hirshhorn, Hauser and Wirth, Montreal Contemporary Art Museum, Australian Center for Moving Image in Melbourne, and many, many, many others. So, Julian, welcome. Um, and, yes. <laughs> if only out of curiosity, has most everyone seen the installation so far. Great, great. So all of this will be insightful, and uh, which is going to be amazing. Um, I think in, in the time that we have, obviously we can't go as deep as we'd love uh, into Euphoria and Julian's practice, but I thought maybe we could start off by talking about the text. And not to compare anything to Manifesto, but with Manifesto you also delved into text and as a, as a starting point and, um, and, uh, and an idea. And with Euphoria, similarly. Um, and I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about how you approached text. Is this where you started from? And, and how did the text come into that part of the process? So uh, allow me to press the pause button before I answer this question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to thank you, Michael, uh, <laughs> before we get into this. Michael has been an amazing supporter of this work, and he loves what he does as chief artistic producer of the Armory. The proof is that he flew to Kiev to shoot with us and dance with us, actually, in the film. You can spot him on screen. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I also want to use the, was, use the opportunity to thank those people of the Armory I've most closely worked with in the past days, uh, Rachel, Davison, Claire, Paul, and many others. Thank you so much. It was amazing to work with you wherever you are. And I want to thank uh, Sammy. There's a good reason why this chair is here. He will join us later. Sammy Musa is the composer of the choir music. Uh, you will talk with him later a little bit about the music. And last but not least, I want to thank 
Jill and Peter Kraus, I know Jill is here, who have generously supported this exhibition. Um, thank you very much. We know each other since many years. You're faithful um, friends of my work and of, of myself. And thank you for coming, Jill, and thanks for supporting. So your question. <laughs> I've started about, um, let me count, because COVID kind of messes up my time, feeling for time, I think about 12, 13 years ago, to work with existing text material. So I started working as an artist almost 30 years ago with found footage, um, aside from my early photographic projects, so video footage. And then about 12, 13 years ago, I started to do the same with text. So, um, trying to get into a material through existing text material, which means a lot of reading at first, and then kind of treating that um, text material as, as raw material for new, for new art. So I'm basically a thief. Um, giving new contextual meaning to the words, uh, no matter from which epoch they, they, they came from, um, dismantling them almost like, um, yeah, like a, surgeon and trying to decontextualize them and then recontextualize them and allow therefore the viewers and the listeners to access these uh, words in a completely fresh uh, way. So the texts you hear here in Euphoria, they are basically coming from 2000 years of humanity, starting with Platon, Sophocles, uh, Horace and so on and until our most recent days. And I could, I could as this subject is obviously an a subject too big for me, I, c I could keep on reading and recollaging forever. It was actually very difficult to draw the line at one point and say, now, now this is it, and now we start really uh, working on, on what we have so far and shaping the text. So that idea of, of stripping the text of its original meaning and context is a way for me, and giving it then to, to figures that normally would not say these things is a way of... Um, uh, using those figures as, as, you could say, vassals of, of these original ideas and then bring a new meaning to it and, and yeah, and, and engaging you as an audience in another way. Did, did you find when you were dissecting and dividing up all these texts uh, and, and assigning them to scenes, uh, how problematic was that or how challenging was that when you have, like, uh, perhaps a more elevated language, talking about an economy versus a more contemporary, casual language. Uh, how, yeah. Well, those of you who have seen Manifesto, which dealt with artist writings from the last 100 years, noticed that all the writing was actually very beautiful, uh, poetic and, and brave and, and uh, yeah, yeah, very um, fantastic in, a, in, a, in the best way. So it was, was not difficult, I guess, to speak those texts. And they were, uh, those artist manifestos and manifesto were written with anger often and, and passion by very young people and meant to be performed or meant to be thrown at an audience uh, publicly. While a lot of the writing here in Euphoria is dry economy, uh, uh, ec economist theory or it's uh, philosophy on economy or on, on uh, uh, financial transactions, there's obviously also philosophy connected to, uh, to, uh, to the idea or the concept of, of capital in it, but it's a lot of dry writing. So the, the, uh, the, the complexity here was, or the difficulty was here, that we could only use text um, that was speakable or performable. There was a lot of very interesting writing, which makes this project also very attackable in a way, right? Because you find a lot of the the words reduced to like one kind of core line, which is very, um, do you say grippy? Whatever, it's very easy to, to, uh, to understand and then you think like, yeah, but I wanna know more and that more is something that you have to add up later or maybe you recognize it, think, oh, that could be that philosopher or that could be that economist and then you, you gotta uh, do your homework in a way in your head while you're watching it or maybe late at home. Actually, just a little hint, we have a reading room here, we've carried a reading room with books from all of the quoted authors and some others. There's also, which I recommend for you to have a look at, the script of Euphoria, where you see which line is written by whom in brackets. And you will see that um, sometimes in one monologue, which seems to be so natural coming out of the mouth, let's say, of the taxi driver, there's about 30 different or even more uh, authors, uh, sometimes just a sentence. 
uh, lined up as if it's all one flow of flow of thought. So the difficulty here was to to say no to some really interesting writing because it was just impossible to speak it. <laughs> so, uh, two questions. Uh, did you have the characters, the scenes in mind before you wrote, before you started collecting text or the other way around? Yeah, maybe a little bit about the, the genesis of this, of this project, which kind of indirectly answers your question. I mostly start, start probably because I'm a visual artist with visual ideas. So I see something um, and that, that image uh, asked me to, be, uh, to, to get out of my head and be realized. So that's my motivation to do art. I don't have a, a lesson to tell or a message to the audience. You often ask artists, like, what, what do you want to tell us? That, to be very honest, it's not the way I approach my work. Uh, it's a nice side effect that at the end there's meaning in the work, but it's a very self, being, a, being an artist is at least for me a very selfish uh, thing. Like I have ideas and I, I have fun or enjoy very much making them become form. And while they're becoming form, they get meaning. Or maybe I understand, I start learning why is it that I'm actually doing this. So for Euphoria, um, it was uh, about 10 years ago that I sat down one evening and just wrote um, a scene uh, for a taxi driver driving through New York. That's 10 years ago. And I had, obviously, Jim Jarmusch in mind, Night on Earth. Um, you know the scene with um, Giancarlo Esposito, who now, again, is behind the wheel of the taxi. That was about 30 years ago, right? And um, Armin Müller-Stahl. Uh, who was originally the driver, but he drives so badly that Giancarlo takes over and says, like, yeah, let me drive. And so my fantasy was that Giancarlo kind of liked that and kept on driving, and I meet him again, like, how long is that ago, 30 years? Or maybe not 30, but maybe 27 or something. Yeah. And he's still driving. And by then I had started to, actually it all started with, uh, with junk mail. I, I, I receive, as all of you probably, a lot of scam. And I started collecting those stories um, because I found them very, very um, creative. Um, I'm the nephew of Saddam Hussein's shrink, whatever. You know these stories. Um, and I find them very funny in a way. And I, they are only out there because they're successful, right? So there are people falling for this. And this makes it so funny to, uh, funny and tragic in a way, because often people falling for it are people that, yeah, don't have the feeling for that. What's and it's it's a bit tragic also, and I have I don't I never counted them but it must be like definitely more than a thousand of these texts which I collected, and I always thought I should do a piece for it. And if you remember in the very first concept paper for this, the overture, which is the the choir singers coming in and start talking, originally were those scam poetic texts. They never made it into the work at the end, for various reasons, anyway. Now it's Paula Fark's praising of capital that they speak out. You only understand a few words. But that idea of combining text and, uh, made me then start to collect text on capitalism. And the other backstory is my, my sheer ignorance towards economy. I often start working on my projects um, based or triggered by my own ignorance that I, 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 I think, like, I have really no clue about this. I want to learn about this. And then I do a project about it to give myself a chance to get into it. So I, I said that a few times in the past days in various situations, but I'm the kind of guy that reads the paper and always jumps over the economy pages because I just don't get it. <laughs> and, and, and it must have been probably uh, around the Lehman crash that I thought, like, maybe economy is even... It's actually, I mean, I always knew, of course, the economy is making politics, but um, by then I thought like, it would be interesting to dedicate a, a project to economy, and I started collecting text material and reading more and so on, and so that was the starting point. And then uh, th there was a very complicated answer to your question, apologies, but we had, um, I say we now, because about three years ago, I invited Tobias Stab, a friend of mine, a dramaturg, to co-read with me. There was just before COVID, and then it was perfect, uh, that decision, because first of all, it was a necessity because there was so much to read that I just couldn't handle it all alone. And then we had um, uh, COVID, which made us 
gave us the perfect chance to read a lot of books, but we also read on Zoom to each other and with each other and shared ideas and cooked it down, narrowed it down more and more to uh, different pots, you could say, and those were, and that answers your question finally, those were the six scenes that I had by then already in my mind, and I knew one thing, that um, there will be a lot of power, you can say, given to marginalized people of our society. So I wanted to give all that, hand those texts over. That was just a rule I gave myself at the very beginning. It's always very helpful to have a few kind of basic rules at the beginning and then you deal with that. Later on we talk about the music, which had also a kind of concept from the beginning. And those rule, that rule was like, um, I want people to speak out this text that normally would not be connected to this text. And that helped me a lot to um, to then find out who could say what. So some text parts, obviously there were always longer text parts and then they were thrown maybe sometimes in two or three boxes. And then you cook them down, you start working on the text collage and you think like, oh, um, that actually makes more sense with the teenagers and not with the taxi driver and so on. So it, it's a way, you know, it's like, like cooking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you said the other day, and I wasn't sure if it was a metaphor or real, where you had, and you just mentioned it, boxes for each of the characters, and that you would actually take some of these blurbs and put them in kid box, taxi box, bank box. Digital boxes, uh, Word document file boxes, yeah. but when we had meetings, Tobias and I, there was always a huge table and a lot of cutoffs, and then we started literally, like like in the good old times when you were script writing, putting together, and that sentence goes up, and that goes down, that goes here, and that is COVID and goes there. Yeah. So it was, yeah. And st uh, so you worked with Tobias, uh, dramaturg. Um, do, would you, it seems like with Manifesto and now with Euphoria, you really had the onus of dealing with text. And some of your early other works, some have no text. So is this a new path for you or you don't see, you don't want that definition? Not new anymore. I think the first one I did it was in 2009 with American Night, uh, which could be interesting for you as you, most of you are probably Americans. American citizens. So um, it's a project that deals with the, the myth of the frontier and the way it kind of echoes in US foreign policy today. It's a Western uh, or an homage to Western film, which was shot in the south of Spain. And I mention it because uh, five of the cowboys sitting around the campfire in American Night are the same five actors that you find in the homeless scene including Bronzy, which is his real nickname, by the way, Charles Bronson lookalike. Um, so I do that a lot, that I kind of steal from myself, probably out of uh, lacking ideas, then the same come back to me or something. And so it's not a new, it's not a new concept, um, but it's something that I think I needed a long time to have the guts to actually work with text. So most of my early work, you're right, is, uh, is uh, dialogue-free. It's not silent, because there's a lot of Sound design. By the way, Thomas Appel, the sound designer, worked with this project also for a very, very long time. An amazing man, amazing artist, is here tonight as well. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, sound is uh, a little. A little side remark: uh, sound is often uh, belittled and overseen, and actually, when. Uh, Generally saying, when, when people are, you hoo we did, we did it, when it's when the, the rap party of, after the end of a shoot, I know, because I've worked a lot with post-production, obviously, and also a lot with sound designers like Thomas and, and musicians uh, and composers like Sami, that that's just, not, maybe not even halfway through, right? There's a lot to do, and, and sound is something we take for granted when we watch, watch a movie, but you can tell so much with sound. You can tell, you can completely change the project through sound and obviously also through editing, and so all that is obviously happening after the end of a shoot, and in this specific project, the uh, whole post-production was uh, extremely complex, yeah. I, and I think it, you can feel it a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. So, would you say, you know, talk about, <clears throat> I don't know if it's admiration or, or, or fascination or, or what, but about, 
and with this particular film, it is about, is it about American economy, American capitalism? Uh, it's you to answer that. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, for me, not so much, actually. I mean, it is taking place in, in America, probably in New York, which is obviously extremely arrogant from my side, not to as a German or German-based artist to say, like, I, I um, place this in New York or in America and say, as if I know about that. I cannot, and I, I, we talked about it before, like why did they choose New York or it came up in another talk? And I, I guess it's because for me, the, uh, the most symbolic place where the idea of capitalism was developed, or is, is, wasn't developed obviously, but was, uh, uh, is, is coming together, like, yeah, was, is, is, is Wall Street. And uh, is, uh, that, that model was imitated worldwide in many places and and the the, the idea of an unleashed kind of liberal, neoliberal market economy is something that as we can all see and as you probably all agree although we are all captivated in that system and also love it in a way because consumption is so much fun to say it provocatively um, it's easy to be a critical capitalist but it's very difficult not to be a capitalist right I'm a capitalist I, I, I mean maybe a socialist capitalist, but I'm still a capitalist. And um, I guess it's very difficult to, um, to get out of, uh, or not get out of it, because get out of it, when, when we hear that, especially here in America, people often say like, oh, communism. That's obviously not true, right? It's about questioning capitalism. Capitalism has engulfed its own criticism, its own, its own critique since long. It, it, it swallows up everything. Um, so the, my, my way of looking at capitalism is, because I'm an artist, is creatively. So I hand over to those children, I think uh, those of you who have been in there, they, they understand that, what I mean. They get all the good text, they get all the utopian, naive, poetic ways out of the trap we are in. And uh, if I would have done the same with, with grown-ups in the project, you would probably say, oh, that's so dogmatic and so um, naive and so ideological. And then why is that? Uh, because we are all so much um, uh, trapped uh, in our defense against our own lifestyle. In a way, we, we know that something is wrong, because we, we just see it, right? Climate change, best example. It's so plastical, it's so clear that we are not doing the right thing. Yet, it's very difficult to give up on, on the privileges that we uh, fought for, we think we fought for so hardly. Then there's this very naive, you can say, example of that uh, kid that starts in the scene that gives this example of the cake and says like, hey, if one, one cake is, is left at the birthday party, then obviously all the kids would wait until, you know, mom or dad divides it, and then who wants something, and then it's divided, and this, and, and, and then she asks like, why is that? because of education, because we all got educated, but educated by our parents, by our teachers, and they gave us the ground structure for understanding what you can do and what you shouldn't do. And that educate, education just doesn't apply for, for capital. And that's, that's bizarre, right? And so the way out could maybe be as, uh, I mean, again, it's maybe ideological and maybe naive, but it's worth the try to think it, to imagine it, to, as one says there, and quoting Brian Masumi, uncouple value from quantification. Like, how cool would that be if we would be amazingly admired for, for not assuming quantity, but quality? Uh, new ideas, poetry, imagination, sharing, community, or love, all these ideas that sound so so wonderful, innocent, and, and childish, but why not? I think, I think um, it's worth a try to think about that at least, and yeah. I'm, uh, I love New York from the bottom of my heart. I, I love the city, I try to be here once a year, yet I'm every time shocked when I go in the subway and see there are no elevators for wheelchair, uh, people in the wheelchair, uh, it's all the, homeless people sleeping down there, all the dirt, and as I said, in the, in the richest place of the world, the money goes somewhere else, and not there, where it's so needed. That's, that's a very hard to, to understand, right? Okay, here I sit as a naive artist and talk about this, 
But that's the nice thing about creating art that we are allowed to do that, and you have to listen to that now. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's it's great. Absolutely. Um, in 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 all your work and in this film as well, uh, there you play with a lot of imagery and surrealism and architecture and um, metaphor of animals and and those things. Uh, Talk a little bit about that and why you use a certain imagery in this film in particular. Yeah, so there's maybe a few general things to say about this. Um, uh, the first thing is that I learned over the years that I don't need to understand exactly why I'm doing something. Um, that actually those images that come out of my guts or of my inner or my f imagination or whatever feeling that I'm privileged to realize uh, through making art, uh, those who are the most subconscious are probably those who give you as an audience most space for your own imagination. And very often I, I understood that um, those images that uh, amuse me most um, are those that I cannot explain to myself why they exist. It's just something that I need to see. Like, uh, an old lady feeding three drones. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? I have no idea. You <laughs> 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 Up to you to decide. But it might give you a lot of space for, yeah, drifting away. And also then maybe through that state in which that images bring you. I mean, the surrealists really know what I'm talking about because they worked a lot with this écriture automatique, automatic writing and sub the subconsciousness, the dream and so on, that obviously for them and for the theory and everybody who, uh, who wants it, on the sofa of a psychoanalyst knows what I'm talking about, that the subconscious is meaningful and important for what we do and what we are. Or dreams are meaningful. And so these, these dreamy images, they, they are in the projects very often without real context or without really knowing why they are. And I also, also do the same, by the way, with my protagonist. If I have if I invent a character, the character has a certain function, let's say he's a, he or she is a, a vessel for certain ideas, then that character might have certain ticks that I invent for that character without really knowing why she or he's doing that. Same, same idea. Then architecture, uh, I, I was trained as an architect. I studied architecture. I never worked as an architect, but I studied architecture and then started to do uh, uh, art um, or visual art. And architecture is in films very often used to um, explain the action or give the framework for, for what is being told in the film. Same with music. The music announces a certain feeling that you should have in a second before it even happened, before the actual action gave you the chance to, to feel that feeling. The music already announces, oh, danger or, or romanticism. Something's coming up. So I like to, uh, on, a, on a middle level in my work, I like to break with those rules of filmmaking. I like to um, play around with it and use architecture in another way, uh, more in an enigmatic way. So I place action in a place, in an architecture or an environment or in a set design where it normally doesn't belong, uh, text where it normally doesn't belong. The music sometimes goes very much along with, uh, with what you see, but very often also completely against it. So it's, it's ways of if you want to interrogating a uh, moving image, um, and I, I said that a thousand times, but I find it really fascinating that uh, the moving image industry, until today, in its more than how long now? More, definitely more than 100 years of its existence, has come up only with three kind of products, um, short film, long film, documentary. And that's obviously uh, ridiculous, right? You can do so much with moving image, and so, uh, this is why I keep on working in the art context and don't do movies because I have a perfect playground for trying out different things that you can do with, uh, with moving image. Um, yeah. Uh, the animals. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the arc. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I want to say something about the animals because you mentioned them. They also start to pop up in my projects. And uh, uh, those of you who are in cultural production know that there's a saying like, don't work with animals and, uh, and children on, on stage. And I, I think it's completely untrue. It's fantastic to work with both children and animals. I highly encourage you all to do that if you're in the 
cultural production. <laughs> um, and, but they have also, like, uh, in, in this project, a very specific function. The children, obviously, um, will have to bear with the world we, we leave for them. Uh, I'm a father of three, so... Uh, or educated three, a father of two, or educated three children. So for me, this is my job also, in a way, to, uh, to, to take responsibility for them, to what we leave to them. And they can um, have this wonderful, um, as I said before, a bit naive or something, they can have this function in, in a project where they, they get to, uh, they're innocent, right? So they get they get this they get the good text, <laughs> like that. They get the good ideas. They get the good text, and they are um, marvelously um, optimistic. That's the children's role in in, in, in my projects, I guess. And the, and the choir does it through Sami's wonderful music as well. The animals are more witnesses of what we're doing wrong. Uh, they will definitely be here after us. The, the children, maybe not, unfortunately not. They will go down with us if we ever go down. But the animals, not sure which ones, but they will survive us. So the witnesses, they, uh, the, the animals, they are witnesses of our being, and they are kind of skeptical observers comment, commenting on what we do. There's obviously the, the Arkinoa motive. Um, uh, there's this cynical tiger, kind of maybe an expression of strength or of... Uh, of a, of a force of nature that is definitely stronger than us, and, and many more. So they, they observe us, and they, are, they were there, for instance, in Manifesto as well, and um, yeah, comment on us, or like our mirror, in a way. Mm -hmm. So I, I suspect every film has its trials, tribulations, obstacles, you know, the armory has never produced a film uh, alongside an artist. And uh, you know, so it was new to us. But I, I, I just, I'm curious. I think this film had a very emotional hurdle that, um, that really took a toll on the production for some time. And um, you know, maybe you want to talk about you know, the relationship to the Ukraine invasion. Yeah. So she had two, two hurdles. One was trying to realize a film during COVID, which obviously mm -hmm. took its toll as well. It was uh, complex and complicated. And um, many of my friends in the, in the film industry uh, were hit by that strongly because productions came to a halt and you need to reorganize. You have extra costs because you have to have a whole medical department in each film production, uh, COVID uh, precautions, vaccinations, and so on testing and so on. So project budgets were rising. On the same hand, project budgets were rising because the one of the few economies that were booming during COVID was uh, television entertainment, video games, Netflix, all that, aside from food delivery, Amazon, and this kind of things, right? So um, the industry was um, <clears throat> booming. Prices went up, capitalist logics. And um, that made the project uh, difficult and expensive. What you are uh, hinting at is we shot, um, following the logics of capitalism, a project on capitalism where it was possible to realize it. Uh, and it was impossible to shoot this project entirely in New York or in the US. So we went to Sofia in Bulgaria, where is a wonderful uh, open air studio with a beautiful New York back lot. It looks like a mixture of East Village, Chinatown, and Soho, or maybe a little bit of Brooklyn as well. That's, that's what you saw, for those of you who have seen Euphoria already, the, the snowy part of the taxi outside with, uh, with all the chaos and the fire and the explosion and the funeral procession, all that, the drone lady and so on, the horses. And that's shot in Sofia. And then we shot a lot of it in, in Kiev. We were four times in Kiev uh, in the last year and uh, this year. And um, two times to prepare and two times to shoot. The bank scene was shot, Michael was there. The bank scene was shot in the uh, main station of Kiev, which we transformed into a big bank called the National Bank of America. I don't think that exists, that title, right? No, I'm sure. <laughs> but it makes so much Maybe sense, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Nadia Götze, our, our set designer, built this counter in the middle of the waiting hall of, of the Kiev station. And every person you see there, not every, we, uh, obviously there were some of some of the cast came with us, but I would say 95% of the people you see on screen dancing there are Ukrainians. 
uh, with whom we closely collaborated, Richard Siegel, who is a very well-known choreographer uh, based in Germany, choreographed the choreography and uh, brought along with him three more dances, and we had a few local dances, and then we had a whole ballet company from, from Kiev and lots of extras and some friends and, and Michael. And uh, uh, we did that, and then the homeless scene uh, was also shot in Kiev, and the um, beautiful, amazing kind of Detroit-like um, bus cemetery. Uh, the background was shot in Kiev. Why only the background? Because when we were about to continue our shoot, we also were going to shoot the factory scene in a super high-tech kind of parcel delivery logistics center in Kiev, brand new. Uh, the invasion was about to happen, and we were hit by it, like, I mean, we knew something's going on, like all of us, because we saw all these satellite pictures and so on, but uh, we were trusting our Ukrainian uh, friends very much and our guts that were wrong, that this probably is just a continuation of the conflict in the Southeast. And we were there when, when Biden said, like, uh, the attack will happen on Wednesday. And then we could, after that, we knew it's not going to happen on Wednesday because Putin is a macho and he will not accept that Biden foresaw the day of the attack. So we knew we are safe, but we could not argue like that with our film team or invite people to cl come, fly into a war zone, although they were willing to partly, and especially the teenagers were about to come and we just said, we have to stop now. Although we, feel, we felt safe and it was still safe that very week, but then the next week it got very unsafe. And then we stopped it. We stopped the production and uh, sent the team home and then continued shooting just that one day. Uh, the kind of, you, you call, pla call it plates, like just the architecture of that building. And then we took one of the very last civil F planes out of Ukraine and then a few days later the invasion happened. So it, um, it was obviously an emotional roller coaster because by then we had been there four times. We had made many friends. Um, we were very worried. Uh, we were in permanent, uh, after two days of complete... Uh, paralyzed, we were on the phone and speaking with individually with many of them where they were and it was literally like like the image was like a bomb hit Kiev and the people were going everywhere. Um, and we hosted people partly, our film team members in Germany, uh, whatever was possible and yeah, that was it brought not only obviously financial trouble and, and organizational trouble into it and delayed the, the premiere which was supposed to be at, in Amsterdam originally, which is now happening next year, but also a lot of a very strong emotionally aspect to it, but also um, we were right at the heart of this subject uh, with it, and a lot of text directly or indirectly speaks about power structures, about war as a, as a money-making machinery and industry, and then I just added up, after the invasion, I just added up that little part of the taxi driver's monologue towards the very end, where he literally talks ab about war, so that was written after the invasion. Everything else they are connected to a bottomless market, you remember that in the factory scene where they say a bottomless market just to produce goods again to, to sell and so on. So that was already there. So we were right at the heart of it in every, uh, in every meaning of the word, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the time that we have left, I'd love for Sammy to come up and talk a Please, little Sammy. bit. Please, Sammy. Yes, Sammy Mosa, who is the composer. And... Uh, <laughs> And yes, please, microphone. Uh, Sammy, if you wouldn't mind talking about where this all came from initially and from your dialogues until what you realized orally. Um, I'm originally from Montreal, Canada, but uh, I uh, immigrated to Germany 15 years ago and uh, and I, uh, I was awarded a prize. At, it's an academy. It's called the German Academy in Rome, Villa Massimo. And the state sends nine artists every year to spend a year in Rome. And Julian and I were both awarded that prize the same year. Myself as a musician and himself, of course, as a visual artist. And so we were neighbors there. And then he mentioned the project. Um, and obviously, it was not for me. Um, <laughs> because he already had 
composers he was working with, but also it was just not uh, drums, and it sounded something I couldn't, I could never do. And uh, um, but then, then we spoke about it, and and then, then I, um, yeah, I did the music. I wrote the music. Is <laughs> is very good at convincing people. Always, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, aren't you? Aren't you? <laughs> Uh, a great love, great friendship here. Um, so what was sort of the, you know, how did you work together? So what was the direction? Um, I hear this, I respond to that. Uh, how, how did you two work together in the creation of the, um, the choral part of the score? Well, there were two periods. There was a first period <clears throat> which was before all the scenes were set. It was still, Julian was still thinking about it, um, and, but he already wanted me maybe to write something, and that was very difficult for me because I was writing in kind of in the blue. Um, but I developed some ideas that um, I used, um, and then there was a second period which is when everything started to accelerate and happened very quickly, when all uh, Julian was getting more or less finished with all the texts, and every scene was very clear what it was what it was about, and it was clear also more. I mean, my task became more clear, precise because the moods and what was needed, we we had discussions about it, and then it went actually quite quickly. I think at that point. But we needed that first period um, for him to, of course, he, he explained it very well with all the text and all the, I mean, very complex work, very long work. But also it gave me time to develop some musical material that was very abstract and, um, and I knew I needed it. So I don't know if you realized it, but, but all the music, except the bank scene, uh, is from composer um, um, Cassie Kinoshi. I wrote the rest. And um, it's all based on one motive, which is um, da da da, just the, that's it. And everything is based on this quicker, slower, different harmonization, etc. But that, that I had to um, invent or compose in the, in the first period when everything was very abstract. So, um, did, was that, did I answer? I think I, Sammy, I, is it Sammy really is just that? About it really is just three notes in variations. Yes, one could say, yes, yes. Bravo. <laughs> How much should we pay I think you? Sammy is. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing. I think Sammy is saying in a very kind and polite and diplomatic way that I was a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Ask him for a lot of patience. Now, the, 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 obviously, in, in a production like that, which got delayed and delayed and delayed, and another thing, another moment of delay which wasn't mentioned was because we were shooting in Ukraine and because it was an about to be war zone, obviously, not many actors said, like, yeah, let's sure, let's go to Kiev, which is strange because Kiev is such a wonderful place, and I hope, I hope you will have the chance soon to visit it. I highly recommend it. It's an amazing city and, and with an amazing, um, the people are amazing and the bars are amazing. <laughs> and it has a, an amazing professional, uh, I mean, film industry and probably different industry as, as well. I do remember the place where we were about to shoot the, the factory scene, the parcel distributing center was absolutely high tech. I've never seen something like that before and we couldn't find that anywhere else in the world later. We just shot that then, but it, um, it, it's nice too, but I can tell you the Kiev place was <laughs> beyond that. So we have this idea of, I mean, me myself, I was a victim of my own kind of stereotype, cliche images of the post-Soviet Ukraine, like dark gray and not true at all, like just not true. <laughs> like, no. And so, um, wait, I mentioned that because the, the, the whole process of developing the project uh, the, of the music was, was also complicated and had some backdraws, which is not so interesting to talk about, but a lot of different tries to find the right people. I had in mind at the very beginning um, two things. Again, I have set myself a rule which is very clear, um, but doesn't make your life necessarily easy, which is that I, want, I wanted only two things, which is the human voice and percussion. 
So she wants the two basic instruments of, of the human body. I can, I can do a rhythm with my hands and I can sing or talk. And limited to that, to those two instruments. So um, that was one. And the other idea was conceptually, what is the function of the choir? And the choir for me was a little bit like the, the choir in an antique Greek theater, like the commenting voice on what you have just seen on stage, the previous scene, the consciousness of society. So here it's clearly an echo of what was just said or discussed in the previous scene, the, the fragments of the text that the children sing in Sami's music is taken from the previous scene always, like with the pipetta, you take it and then you, it was handed over to Sami. Sami had a saying there too, because I gave him more text than was needed, so he could decide according to the patterns of the music Maybe you can what, speak about what, that, what, what makes sense. Yeah, if you want, so go ahead. Yeah, because, um, of course, this movie has a very strong ideological content, you know, f because of the sources. And um, so, w so that was uh, a f for me a little bit uh, difficult um, to work with um, uh, because I, I I was not personally I'm not comfortable you know really in, in discussing politics although I studied politics in my previous life but anyways and uh, I um, no it's true <laughs> I'm I'm older than you think um, no, it's not true I'm younger than you think. <laughs> Anyways, um, um, but um, uh, so, and I had, of course, the same feeling. Before you even mention it, I had the same feeling. This is a Greek chorus for sure, of course, obviously, and um, and I wanted the text to be as p poetic as possible in the context, and always, and that was very interesting discussions together, to try to find the most, not the most, because I'm sure could have found maybe something better. But anyways, the, the, at the moment, it was what appeared to be the most poetic thing in the context and um, that we can build on. And, um, and I wanted something also very simple and also Julian as well to, to get something that's very clear and uh, yes. And, you know, just one last thing on the, on the score. So with the Greek chorus concept, uh, you know, where's, Whereas sometimes they are reflecting on what just happened, and sometimes they're propelling the next scene forward. Um, who, how was that decided? But did, was that intentional? Am I making this up? Everything, Do you hear that? Everything was intentional, I think. Yeah. And so maybe I can say something about the, the function of the drums because they are, they yeah. it's very important too. So the, the, the idea of bringing in that jazz element derives from, 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 two, from two things in my head. One was that I always wanted to do a filmic piece on a jazz drum solo, being a jazz fan since my adolescence and um, a jazz drum fan from that time too. So I always thought it was... It would be beautiful to to film a jazz drummer, which is not well, we we filmed them, but it's not what I had in mind. What I meant, and that's not for this project. That's why it's not there. Uh, but what I meant is um, following the the narrative element of a jazz drum solo combined with rhythm, uh, and try to translate that into a film piece. Now, filmmakers in the audience, feel free to steal that idea from me now and just realize it. Um, uh, I didn't do that, but I always wanted to do a filmic piece, and I always wanted to work with, with jazz musicians, especially jazz drummers. It was one thing, and then the other thing was talking, uh, thinking about capitalism and the monetary system and the complexity of it, of, of money transactions, of uh, computer calculations, of uh, stock exchange and all that. I thought that maybe some of you remember the, um, the uh, Cine Manifesto with the brokers, uh, where a lot of futurist text was read. Futurists, uh, as you know, were uh, completely fascinated by technology, and I imagine at the time that maybe in the in the 20s they were fascinated, or in the early 10s or 20s they were fascinated by trains and, and race cars. And, and our, what would they be fascinated about nowadays? And I thought, yeah, probably they would be fascinated by international uh, high-speed trading or something. And so it ended up being there. So I needed a rhythmic element, something that is like the machinery of, of, of capitalism and, or of, of, of an uh, unleashed free market economy. And, and that's the drummers for me. Uh, again, that doesn't have to be sad because you will feel it there or not, or you feel something else. But that was what I had in mind. Um, 
bringing the drum drummers into it. And it worked pretty well. I think they, um, uh, Sami obviously has structured rhythmically the, the singing. If you remember the first chapter um, after um, uh, the taxi scene, it's, it's very percussive in a way, the way it is sung already. And so the, the drummers, for the drummers, it was very easy to uh, find their way into it. We had two days together with them, and they were very, very intelligible and, and understanding of Sami's music. And, understood that the one thing we said is like, let's not try to have any kind of drum battle here, any kind of, I mean, there's this one moment where it goes all around, but it's not a competition, it's just more like a, a surround experience. For the rest, the idea was that the rhythm is decomposed and they try to listen very, very well to what the others do and just create like one drum uh, set all together, the five of them. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, Julian, uh, we at the Armory couldn't be more thrilled that you selected us to participate with you. Sammy, um, the score has never sounded better. Um, we have co-produced or co-commissioned this production with several other partners. Um, uh, it will travel to the Holland Festival in Amsterdam this summer and four days later to Melbourne. So you'll be very jet lagged. Um, and uh, other, other organizations in the future will be uh, presenting the work in different configurations. But for now, we are thrilled that you are here. And we thank you all for coming this evening and hearing a little bit more about Julian's process and his work with Euphoria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.